Hello, welcome to Polestar Live one-on-one. -on -one. Once again, and today I'm happy to be here with critically acclaimed singer-songwriter, <laughs> guitarist extraordinaire, and entertainer above all, Brad Paisley. And uh, the list is long of his accomplishments, three Grammys, two American Music Awards, 15 Academy of Country Music Awards, and 14 CMA Awards, including the coveted Entertainer of the Year. Uh, he's been a proud member of the Grand Ole Opry since 2001. And uh, he's also written 21 of his 24 number ones and accumulated 3.6 billion on-demand streams. Billion's a big number. Uh, the <laughs> single I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's a lot. They're listening. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, today we're proud to have Brad Paisley. How you doing, Brad? I'm doing great, Ray. How are you? You good? Yeah, hanging in there, man. And I appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, you know, I wanted to jump right in there. First, what what was your touring plan for 2020? What would you have been doing? <laughs> was is the key word, right? <clears throat> We had a lot. We had a lot of stuff planned. It was it was really. I mean, it was very exciting looking year. I always I always kind of looked, especially in recent years, at these like, like okay, where are we going? Oh, cool, we're going to Chicago. Oh, cool, good, we're going back to California. We're doing that, you know, that new amphitheater. Uh, I forget where. Uh, you know, it's it just one after another. I was looking at them and thinking, oh, that'll be great. And then we had Europe in the middle. We had a really cool Europe run that was probably going to be happening about now. And it was uh, like mid-July and it was a bunch of festivals, which is really cool because, you know, I hadn't really done that thing in Europe too much. I'd done a couple of festivals here and there, but we were like starting a festival in Germany, really. And and that felt right. Like that, that felt like that was going to be a great thing for country music in Germany because when we played Berlin, the last time I couldn't believe how uh, how just enthusiastic they were and they don't get a lot of country music so that felt like in the middle of, of hitting some of the countries that we go to sort of every every other year we were starting a new one that I felt like would probably be really sort of ripe for for country music to be there and that all you know I remember that going away early on as we were reshuffling the deck you and I were talking about it uh, about how you know everything just they just kept kicking the can down the road I mean you'd see dates that were going to be in May rescheduled for August and now the dates that were going to be in August are now pushed off to next year and and as far as the European run goes I don't know when we'll do that um, that's probably going to be another layer of issues as far as looking at like it'll be one thing to sort of get back on track in America and then, but then to actually cross borders and, and play in other countries might take a minute, but all of it will someday come back. It's just, and I, and I do believe with more enthusiasm and more, um, just more of a love of music from the audiences than before. I just think there's no one, including the, the music artists, that will take for granted the experience of live music again together. Yeah, well, I, I know it's true for me, and it's I bet it's true for you even more so, but I think we, I kind of took it for, well, maybe you didn't take it for granted, but I certainly did because I've been going to 50 shows a year for, uh, oh, yeah. for, right. for 40 years, right? So, right. Uh, and then when's the last summer you spent, huh? Oh man, 1998. <laughs> I didn't have any reason to be home that I was, you know, I, I mean, I, last time I spent a summer at home, as far as most of the summer, I was wanting so bad to get a, a record out there. So, you know, I, it's an interesting thing in a career. You'll see artists that take a year off sometimes, you know, um, I've never done that until now, if you count this as a year off and it's, it's at least from the road, um, you know, that, that'll that say, you know, we're going to take a year and only do a few dates here and there and next year we'll do a big tour. We never did that. I've never done that. I mean, we always, I always just thought, 
there's there's so many places on this planet that want country music that to take a year off is to i mean you can you can give markets a rest i've always had that philosophy but if that's the case what cities didn't we play last year because it's not like we played all 50 states last year at any given point um we could we could give it a rest in some major markets one year and play some smaller markets or go to states like Maine and North Dakota and play shows where you don't you don't go as often and and um so I just never did I just never took that that year and you know and that's also such a luxury in, in the entertainment world like what what uh brain surgeon gets to take a year off <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah, but in music, sometimes we do things like that. And this is the first time I've really ever done it. So it kind of feels, it feels like this is the, this is the only time I'll probably get to do that. And that's fine with me. I didn't ever really want to. And, but I think it's been a fun recharge type time for a lot of us um, with family and um, creatively, uh, you know, some a lot of my friends that I talk to that are other artists and, you know, we're all feeling the stress of, of what it's done to our industry, but we're all also making the most of it uh, with family, I think. Yeah, well, I, I do believe any taking it for granted. I think we've been on such a run in the live business, particularly, right, for 10 right. years straight of nothing but increases in records every year that any taking it for granted, I think, is over. And, and yeah. we're going to appreciate what we have more a, as a business and the whole live thing and going to shows and being being around groups of people that are into the same thing. Uh, and that's true for sports or any live event. I think oh, yeah. we'll appreciate it a lot more when we get going again. We really will. I mean, yeah, I, I, I used to say – as they would struggle with, you know, uh, bootleg stuff happening and the record industry kind of hitting the hitting the, the basement for a bit there when when streaming wasn't wasn't rev creating any revenue at first and and sales were declining and people weren't you know and live music just felt like something that people thought should be free <laughs> for a minute there and and. Uh, I just used to say, well, they'll never, they can never take away that, that live experience. Right. <laughs> At least there's that. <clears throat> well, yeah. careful what you say, but you know, in, in our case, um, like with these, with this run we did of, of driving shows, which was kind of a, that was kind of a, uh, a test run as much as a got, got it in under the wire here before, before, this virus flared up again um it was like okay how do we say we're not going to take this lying down and how do we not get anybody sick you know well you reacted pretty quickly i think by may you did the full-on set from the steel mill right three million right. i think it's three million views now and you had a, a, a great sponsor in bud light and Right. Uh, so, how long did it take you to realize? Well, we're not going to have a, a tour. Let's let's do a show. Put put the get the band and crew together and, and play some live music. I mean, that was a full on production, right? Yeah, that was that was very that was very therapeutic for us and a, such a gift from Bud Light in the sense that when when I started uh, I started doing these things from home that a lot of people were doing where where you would do go live on Facebook and mm -hmm. uh, and sing songs. And my wife and dad were the camera people and I played and I had a couple of guests zoom in like Carrie and Tim McGraw and, and these guys and, and Kelsey and, you know, and, and, uh, and that was fun and it was totally lo-fi and it reminded you of public access television <laughs> and it was just, it was just so absolutely amateur and, and, uh, but fun and I think people really res responded to that and then Bud Light reached out at one point and said hey we want to do this dive bar series from, from your house on a Friday where they basically send you a bunch of Bud Light and a neon sign you stick it up and you sing songs for people and they sort of 
they sort of promote it for you, which is great. And it's a really, they've been such a great partner for musicians during this time. And I think they realize they're one of the few products that's probably in some way uh, not affected. <laughs> if anything, I would imagine, I, did, I don't know the figures, but I would imagine they're drinking more Bud Light today than they did before this began. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know. Uh, but you, the thing went really well, and then you, you've had a quarantine, speaking of Bud Light, you've had a quarantine anthem of sorts uh, as a single out right now with no eye and beer, and uh, that's a pretty good synergy for them, I guess. It was, and it was actually accidental on their part, and, and uh, because when they asked me to do the drive-in series, I hadn't put that out yet, but I had already cut it and gotten it ready, and mm -hmm. and because uh, that song was written a couple of years ago, but sort of, you know, I re-sang it and got it basic. Thank, thank goodness I had the track cut, because I don't know how, you, at the time, there was no recording at all going on, and, and um, so that's when they came after the, after the uh, drive-in, or, or the uh, what you call it the uh, dive bar series they came to me and said um you know we're thinking about now that now that they're allowing like 10 people per building type situation and it's opening up a little bit we're thinking about doing a production from somewhere and uh and that's where we came up with the idea to to just get everybody on my crew to sort of work together in a really a really thorough safe way to just set up what we would have taken out on the road and play for people on that and that that uh seltzer sessions thing that you're talking about um that was pretty surreal i, I i'll never forget the day that i walked in uh, they had spent three days setting up our gear that would have taken i guess six hours on a normal show day you know but they no one could be any closer than six feet apart so that became you know they had to think carefully on how you load things in trucks and the dollies and thankfully the steel mills where we keep a lot of stuff so you didn't have to like haul it down the road or anything and and everybody had to be masked everybody had to have their temperature checked and that was before testing was widely available so they you know we basically everybody was checked to make sure they were okay. And, and we did this thing full mask, except for the band. Um, the funny thing is if you look and my guitar tech is changing guitars with me. He, we did, we had the system where he'd, he'd hold it by the neck and, or he'd hold it by the body and stick the guitar out and the neck would come toward me and I'd grab it by the neck and pull it towards me. So he was never that close either. And Matt, he was full masks and gloves. And I looked like I was, you know, in the middle of surgery out there. Um, you know, as on the guitar yeah. changes, but, but uh, that we felt the pressure on that because we knew that if, if 20 of the 50 people that needed to, to put this on in some way ended up sick, that'd be it. There'd be nobody else able to do it because you'd point to that and you, you don't want that. You don't want that for anybody, but more than that, you don't want to ruin the chances of, of the whole industry to do some, some live productions like that. Um, because we also had the sense, and I said this early on, even when they started opening up everything and there was some live music happening here and there in bars and places, I, I said, I just don't think this is going to last like this. I just, until they, until they eradicate the disease, um, it's kind of, it felt sort of like we really need to make sure that this kind of thing, being able to play safely uh, over the internet, um, is preserved well you have to figure something out you know and you and plus people want to work they want to do something and yep uh and you did kind of crack the code there and i think again on the drive-in shows how was that brought to you and what was appealing enough about it for you to go ahead well and do it uh live nation brian o'connell and patrick mcdill and everybody over there um <clears throat> you know that this has been as rough a time for that company and that industry as you can imagine um and those guys i've worked with them i i think brian and i've been doing shows together for 20 years at least um and 
they came to us and said, all right, here's what we're thinking about doing. We want to try to create, as opposed to just playing in a, an actual drive-in setting, we want to create these, but in a, in, in the sense, we want to do it in the, the parking lots of the places you would play and as opposed to inside the venues. And, um, we were toying with the idea, if you want, you, you know, if, if we think we could do this, you could do a three city run in a weekend where as long as they're not far away from Nashville, would you be willing to explore that? And I said, absolutely. I, I said, the trick really needed to be that everybody stays safe. Like we can't, I did not want a situation where they rush the stage at any point and form a mosh pit. That would have ruined it for everybody going forward if there's any more of these to happen. And, you know, and the same goes for my goal. I said, my goal with the show is that the people in that, in, in that audience, in the parking lot next to their cars, the way it is arranged, I hope are safer at that, during that hour and a half, to two hour performance than they are in their real lives. Because you know, in the sense that I, I want them to have less chance catching that virus at my concert than they do with the chances they typically take in life as they live right now, which I think was probably the case. Like I think they were in way more danger when they go out and go in the CVS or the grocery store of contracting the virus than they were at our concert because the way that it was arranged, they were only with the people that came in their car. Um, but as you can imagine, it, it was a NASA launch, trying to figure out every, every, cause everything you can think of that's normal, going down the road on the bus. I, I started talking about it and I said to my management, I said, well, I think what we should do is go rent an extra bus or two and split up how many people are on these as opposed to, you know, that way you, you just, you just want to minimize the amount of people in groups and, and we'll get everybody tested and we, we would test the high, high, high risk people in my crew and make sure that they were good. Um, and then we would place them on buses based on who was going to work together, but they also wore masks on the buses and there were no more than four or five on a bus as opposed to 10 people on a bus for this. And it was also only a four hour drive so they could get there. And then they, they took the, the most surreal part of it was here we are in the parking lot of the amphitheater that we play in St. Louis. And they utilize the facilities in the amphitheater and the dressing rooms and the backstage and everybody had their own dressing room because there was just not that many crew comparatively. We did not interact with the local crew. They had set up the stage and the PA and the video wall before we got there. The local crew did. So then once we got there, they went to work with what was sitting there. No interaction. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a NASA launch. It was literally uh, all those guys with headsets and white shirts and black ties sitting in Houston. <laughs> and, and then, you know, meanwhile, the bus drivers slept in the, uh, in the uh, dressing rooms so they didn't have to go interact. Uh, I mean, it was just thinking of everything. Um, we toyed with, and I don't even know if we did this because there's so much of it that I, it was off, out of my hands and they, and they were thinking of this, but they did a really good job. But I, one of the things we toyed with was just renting another bus that was the bus driver's sleeping bus. So they don't have to go in a Holiday Inn. Yeah. That's I mean. A sleep room, sleep, sleep bus. Which, right. Hey, that's that's how you got to think. But it, you, as far as the actual show, what was that like? Was it as you as a performer? Did you get that feedback? I did. I mean, it was you had to you had to tailor your expectations for what it was like, what they were giving back. One thing that was absolutely the same was the experience of sharing that with people, of sharing live music with human beings. Like that didn't feel, if anything, that, that there was, it was kind of emotional for me. Um, I hadn't looked at faces since early March when we did a small Canada run that was abruptly canceled in the middle. Yeah. Um, like we got one in past the goalie 
because yeah. when they had, you know, when the NBA walked off the court on March 11th or 12th or whatever that was, the next day, like Live Nation basically said, we, we we're pulling the plug right now. But I was in Canada in Saskatchewan where they had absolutely zero cases of it. <laughs> yeah. And so we played that one show and knew that everything in America was just canceled. And so we, I got up on stage that night and said, we are going to stay here until they kick us out of this building. And we know this is probably the last time we're going to be doing this for a while. And got, I got the experience of being able to, to savor one last normal live performance mm. with the audience, you know, like normal, t mosh pit, everything. And we were careful, but at the same time, we knew, you know, there were just no cases in upper Saskatchewan. I forget where we were, somewhere like Moose Jaw or something. Vagina, maybe, but really yeah early on uh but i i guess that did loom pretty large and, and haven't played until you did the drive-in show so it, it it was weird and and uh the drive-in shows felt like when as a band we felt so normal the audience response you start to realize how important that front row is yeah which our front row was more like row 30 as far as distance away because the cars were set up, there was a barricade, and then there were the cars, and but but it wasn't any less powerful to me because in the front row, the very first gig was St. Louis, and in the front row, I looked, and the first of all, the back row of cars was a quarter mile away, so that's a crazy sight. There's just cars, just, you're playing for CarMax at this point, <laughs> in a CarMax parking lot, and I looked down and there's there's a sign with a little boy holding a sign next to his parents in their car and it says this is my first concert and there's a little girl holding a sign on this side and it says you're my first concert and i'm and i talked to them in the middle of the show i was like okay so i, I said show those signs i said so i want you to know someday <laughs> you're gonna look back and go that was weird <laughs> but right now this feels like a concert to you but you don't know any better. This is not how we normally do this. And I, you know, and also I was thinking to myself, like, you're just thinking of things the whole show. Like I usually throw guitar picks to that front row. I don't know if I got to hit the front row, but more than that, should I really be throwing guitar picks out in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, and I didn't, I, I don't know. I just, these are things that it's just a weird new world. Was there consistency from night one to night two to night three? And did you get your groove going by the same? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. And, and uh, we had our, you know, what's interesting is as a, as a band, these guys have been with me 20 years and we had our groove going first song of St. Louis. Um, we, we had it going when we did the steel mill thing. I mean, it was like, we didn't really, you know, we didn't, we didn't go into, the big changes that would go into a, a tour. Like when we played the steel mill thing, we kind of went with a set list that's kind of some conglomeration of what we have done in the past because we know it. Um, typically with a tour, as you know, we would do two weeks of rehearsing and yeah. a new set list and some new, we did, we did a little new content for the steel mill thing, but really it was more about setting up and playing. And, um, but in the case of, uh, of the shows for that we did tailor the set list in a way that felt like it was good with the drive-in like if it if it felt like something that that had great video content because we had the big video wall and i knew that was going to be important for that back row of cars we play that you know uh, there were songs that i just thought they they would go over in that setting um but yeah we hit we hit our groove really easily up there on the stage the band and i Good. I guess it's some kind of template uh, for what we may be facing when we can start up. And uh, in some ways, you were a guinea pig for that. One thing I think is that I think the concept is fantastic. And it might be really, really fun when this is over, too. Yeah. 
like to do one where you don't have to go in shifts to restrooms and sanitize them every 20 minutes and and also where you can mingle with your buddies on in their truck you know that would be that would be fun um it'd be fun to do one of these like that that's almost a a festival setting that's basically a car show meets a music fest and i think that would be fun um eventually uh if you could do it in such a way that where the the barriers are restricted or 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 lifted um but yeah it's like um but as far as that goes like we felt like doing this was a really important thing for morale for not only fans to be able to purchase something and experience something safely and not get sick after it's over not take a chance on their lives and for my crew and band and everybody to feel like um, that we are making a difference with music because that's really everybody who plays music live wants to make a difference in the time that they're up there doing it even the guys that run monitors and and lights they want to make a difference there's a reason they're in this industry and they they know that what they're bringing to people is a necessary thing and what is to me the most important thing is that you get to do what you're gifted at and um so that felt so rewarding for us to do and uh you know and some i do think that there's there's going to be day days coming where there's different levels of this disease and obviously we're seeing a terrible time right now um but if if we were to get that curve down or a vaccine comes along but maybe the rollout for that is slower than we expect it could be that we end up with a situation where we can do some more things like this some conglomeration of this where we get to go out and play music in a way that's satisfying to people gives us a little bit of livelihood and also you know it's a stopgap to get us back to life well uh, i'm glad you uh, it's very clear to me that as a country and as a world we we miss music and we need it live music and we need that common purpose and, and getting together just for the for the fun of it and the joy of yeah. it you you've done uh you're talking about doing good and I wanted to not waste this time without talking about the grocery and, and tell me how that came about and how it's going. Well, um, that's been another thing that feels like, uh, it just feels like the timing couldn't have been stranger and, and in retrospect, more divine. Um, several years ago, maybe three years ago, maybe more now, um, a, a group, I, I saw this amazing thing in Santa Barbara called Unity Shop, which was a similar situation to what we are doing in Nashville. And basically went to the lady that runs that and said, okay, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm gonna steal this idea. And she's like, please do. I would love to see this in other cities. And so we came to Nashville and got a really smart group of people together uh, that were, that became a board of directors uh, and started having sort of monthly board meetings and said this is what we want to do and they all got on board so quickly and were so passionate and they're still on the board and we started going down the road for this and took three years to raise the money float the idea around nashville create uh sort of a a place that we think is what nashville needs that's tailor-made for our city and the the real key to it was belmont university um at one point i had this idea to go to my alma mater and say and i went to dr fisher and i just said here's what we want to do imagine a hunger charity that's a free grocery store for people who lose their jobs and want the dignity of a of choice with yeah. the food that they're picking up but we stock it with belmont students we staff it with these kids that you and i both know i was one we're a bunch of selfish bastards. So it's like, get these college kids to, to go understand hunger in a, in a, at a time when they're not really thinking about that. They're, they're mostly there to figure out what they want to do with their life, but they 
imagine the path that you put them on. And Dr. Fisher was all in. I mean, he just really was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for for the school. And that's how we wound up with the location that we're in uh, down there by Belmont. And, and uh, you know, here we are now. We launched in March and we launched early because of the tornado. Uh, we, we were going to do a big rollout and sort of a big ribbon cutting. And instead we just said, you know what? And my wife, my wife and I went on Instagram and said, we're open for business. Come in if you need food. And you were affected by this tragedy. Come on in. So we opened, people come in and it was beautiful for a second. It looked like you would expect people walking through there, getting their groceries. It really did operate the way I thought it would. And then uh, all hell broke loose and we are hit with the worst economic situation in our lifetime. And, you know, when you open a grocery store for people that are on hard times and lose their jobs at the time when unemployment has shot up to whatever it is this week, um, there's a lot of pressure to get that right. But I was given a figure a few weeks ago that we had, we had provided we're, we're doing five times what we expected to do at this point in terms of the, the meals we're providing. Um, we've had to modify, we deliver to the elderly people, you know, we, they come to the store and we, we give them their groceries at the door when they're not allowed in. At, at some point they were able to come in and shop recently, but um, we were at 90,000 meals served a few weeks ago and I heard a figure that we're in the six figure range like well above that now um, and it's pretty crazy. It's sad but it's it's rewarding it's sad that there's that kind of need and probably much more uh, but yeah. you're on two things that you really hit I mean there's nothing more basic than something to eat but yep. you, but to have it any choice in the matter that's where it's at man I mean to be yeah. able maybe eat what you want to eat instead of what somebody gives you and to have that, uh, that dignity around it. And that's the, that's the interesting thing to tie it all in. It's like the, that dignity of choice and that, that ability to sort of say, you know, like the idea, the, the, the idea came in that like the, with the woman that started the one in Santa Barbara, she said, you know, um, she would see this man come through the soup kitchen where she was volunteering and he came in three days in a row and he would just push his peas off to the side of his plate. And, you know, a big old pile of peas that they would put on his plate. And, and she's like, she's like, why do you do that? And she's like, I don't like peas. They weren't even asking him if he wanted them. They just put them on his plate, you know? Mm -hmm. And she just realized people need to be able to say, here's the things I eat. Do you have these? And, if you're a, a, a father or a mother on hard times and you go in there with your kid, the reason it's called the store is also about the dignity aspect because it's, it's to normalize the experience. Like you can say to your kid, okay, uh, grab your sister. We're going to the store. The kid thinks that's, this is a grocery store. They don't know they're not paying. Yeah. And um, that part of it, we'll get back to that part of it eventually once everything normalizes again but the key aspect of this place is that it, the timing really I'm, I'm so glad if it, if this pandemic had happened a month earlier we wouldn't have been ready for this right we were ready to launch our permits came literally like the week before the uh the tornadoes so you know god's timing is perfect and as they say and and this felt divine and you know, was what, what was really neat, too, is that you're, we're learning that in these times, creativity, I think, wins the day in yeah. terms of what music does. And it's just like the one we did in Nashville where we, we did this live stream. And Tim Gerst, that runs a lot of my social media stuff, said to me, hey, Facebook has this new tip feature where you can tip. I said, what if we live stream your Nashville show? And we let people donate to the store instead of tip the band. And I'm like, great, let's do it. Let's see what happens. The next thing you know, we played our show like normal at Nissan in the parking lot, broadcast it for everybody to see if they wanted. It was free and just said on there, hey, if you, if you feel like it, if you're enjoying this, 
hit the tip jar and that money will go to the store for Nashville. We raised $26,000 by, and, and that was without trying. That was like an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, let's try that and see. I thought we'd raise a thousand dollars. You know, people, if that. People figure it out really quick, man. And, uh, and, they that, do. and a lot of that impulse has been diluted, I think too, during this, because you're not out and about and you don't see the need, right? Like you would. I think that's true. Uh, I wanted to, the natural segue for me is always beer, but so you've got, a, <laughs> you've, uh, but you're, we're on a Zoom call and it's, it's cool. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews with you in person or on the phone, but not this. So that's cool. <laughs> you, you've been no stranger to Zoom calls, right? Uh, yeah. Kind of showed up unexpectedly and, uh, you got the new video coming out, right? Right. Yeah. Did they send you that yet? I, I had a ball watching it. It's really cool. Oh, good. Uh, t tell me about that and uh, what, what people can expect around it and how fun it was and how you got the, the participation that you had. Uh, like some of the musicians that, I don't know if they're amateurs. I know I'm not familiar with them that are playing on it, but uh, it's just a really cool idea. And I think it's obvious. Of its well, time. Tim McGraw's an amateur. Yeah. Okay. You're talking about the guitar players, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah. no, the the rest. Uh, thanks for watching that. I I had a really good time. I didn't realize I was making a music video as a lot of those things were happening, but every uh, there's something like I was told after I just edited it together and just kind of put together all this footage of what kind of we've been doing that kind of fits the song. Um, and somebody told me there's 225 or more people on the, in this video, as you can imagine, it was a legal nightmare to figure out <laughs> the releases, but like the, the, uh, I, I heard that it's something like 35 countries, maybe 50 countries. I don't know. Um, we, what we did was Scott Scoville helped me with a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, preliminary gathering of it in the editing sense, um, you know, when this, when this began, I started jumping on Zooms. I got the idea to do a Zoom, to, to start doing Zooms with fans from Peyton Manning, who had been, he had done one for the University of Tennessee where he jumped into class thing. And then he ended up calling me a couple of days later on a call just like this. And he, it was a Saturday night and it felt like the world had ground to a stop, which it had. And we were, and I was walking from the house down to the barn. And I'll never forget, I looked down and there's a text from Peyton and it says, jump on this Zoom and there's a link. And I texted him back and I went, now? And he went, yes. And so I hit the Zoom, boom, and I come up and I'm looking at Peyton, his ugly face. And He's like, hey, Brad Paisley, say hi to everybody. And I look and there's like, there's already 20 people on it. And some of them are University of Tennessee alums, Peerless and people like that. And wow. there's a newscaster and there's, there's, uh, I'm trying to think of who else is on there. And he's like, all right, Brad, the, the challenge is everybody's got to get a famous person out of their Rolodex on here for the calls up. And we're going to see who, who all we can get. So, I got Darius. I texted Darius. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm watching the R. Kelly documentary. I said, stop. Doesn't end well. Get on here. <laughs> and he's like, so he, he jumps on and, and uh, there he is. And then I think he got Dan Patrick and then Kevin Hart ended up in there. And I mean, it was hilarious. And we were all on there just on a Saturday night, ended up with 50 different people on zoom, everybody trash talking each other, you know, Dan making fun of, of uh all Darius's like merino memorabilia behind him and um and I thought okay this is too much fun and then I sent out a thing to my my text chain these people that could text me and just said if you are having a a party or something and want me to jump in I'm bored well as you can imagine I mean I just started and I just started hitting accept the invite and I just ended up in everybody's lives and and a 
there's just a fraction of those. I don't know how many I've done since this began. A fraction of those are in this video. Some of the, the cool ones, um, you know, and, and to me, this has been one of the rewarding parts of this time period. With fans in meet and greet, I never meet them. They come through, we take a photo, they want something signed or they want, you know, whatever. To, they, they, we may have one small conversation or a sentence or two. It's like, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Hey, my sister went to high school with you. Oh, that's cool, tell her hi. Uh, that's about all you get. As opposed to a Zoom call like this where I'm, I'm seeing people in their homes. Like right now, I see boxing gloves behind you. I could make fun of that. Um, <laughs> Eric Church. You know, Eric Church. Oh, that's Eric Church. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Like like Eric Church can box. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm kidding. But no, it's like, it's it's so much fun. I mean, we're we're able to, to really have a conversation. And so when the song, I, I realized that this song is summed up best by these zoom parties we're having it's like people are drinking their way through this pandemic and and i and, and uh, the first idea came from i said i tell you what i want to do i want to do a virtual zoom pub crawl this weekend on saturday night you have a bunch of your friends and we were all in quarantine at the time on zoom on saturday between seven and nine and i'll jump in Send me the invite, I'll hit as many as I can. And I think I did 30 Zoom rooms that night in a two or three hour period. Uh, it was a blast. I mean, every one of them, I'd jump in, they'd go nuts. We'd talk, we'd sing, goof around, ask them questions. They were, you know, some of them were more hammered than others. And then, you know, by the end of it, just kept going. And I was starting, and I started to look for really fun things that were, like and also meaningful things and i would see i would see everything from nurses that just got done with a shift having a having a drink at home on zoom to kind of you know process what they'd been through and i'd jump in and they were the covid ward in dallas and it was just so meaningful and the same with um you know grocery store workers that dress like superheroes to work to go to work uh, as a fun way of like taking some of the stress of that experience off people and the, to the culmination being you know this there's these guys that had this uh, the, a white guy and a black guy best friends and, and during the, the riots they had they invited the whole neighborhood over to the parking or to their little driveway to share a beer and talk and so we we bought out aj's beer warehouse and sent that to him and uh, went on zoom with them and they're in this video and um, all the way down to the, the kismet, there's the strange things of even when, even when I would do something like look for the local warehouse, we found AJ's beer warehouse. We found out that there was a tie with a make a wish from years ago with a, with the man that owns it with me and, and, uh, and a daughter. And, and he was like, I'll get the beer there, whatever it takes. Wow. Things like that. And so it's been, this kind of feels like a little, this video feels a little bit like a yearbook for me. I think recap. You're, it's an amazing video. I had a lot of fun watching. People are going to love it. I, you're getting the same weather I am. There's a lot of thunder. You must be in uh, the Nashville area. Yeah. It's, yeah. We've had quite the year that way, haven't we? Yeah, we have. I mean, I can tell when my dog starts getting scared that, but uh, then it's probably going to be a storm coming. I have the same thing. Our dog does the same thing. He's like, he is fearless until thunder. And then I, I don't know. Dogs hate it. Yeah, they don't like the 4th of July either. I, I do. Look, you've been real generous I, I, with your time. And you, you're touching a lot of lives still, Brad. And that's what's, what's great you. about it. Um, and in a positive way. Just our, after playing last weekend and uh, getting that, get the feel of it again are, are you optimistic that when live music comes back that the fans will be waiting and we can pick up close to where we left off oh i think i'm i'm up i'm beyond optimistic i i, I don't know if if it's going to be the turn the light switch on that's up to really medical world and science and whatever but i know that people will be ready to um, as far as back to normal, absolutely. I think that we are going to be looking at 
way more enthusiastic audiences we're going to all have to be creative because we're all going to hit the road at the same time so we're going to have to really think about how we do it but people will flood the venues i believe that i just think uh, yeah i can't i can't even imagine I, the things i took for granted the hanging out with the guys after the show's over in a city sitting around in the like one of our rituals used to be like every now and then like we would rent out a movie theater and take the whole the whole tour opening acts everybody and go see a movie at midnight uh as a perk as a fun thing like if it was the avengers had a movie out or something awesome we'd go get popcorn give free tickets to the movie theater manager we'd all go have an experience sit together these are things that you know we took for granted um and i know that when it comes to audiences just the idea that they get to jam in together and just flat out high five somebody you don't even know yeah because you love what you just saw mm -hmm. you know i would see i would see guys do that when when i would have something awesome in a concert like when carrie underwood would come up on uh, FaceTime and sing Remind Me with me in a concert, I'd, you'd see dudes go, oh, you know, they'd high five. I don't even know if they knew each other. We took that for granted. You can't do that. So yeah, when, when we're allowed to do these things, I'm very optimistic. I think we will be, we will have been through the fire together, audiences and performers, and we will not, we, you know, we'll take this very seriously. And also we will have more fun than than we've ever had before. Well, I'm ready for it. I know you are. And, uh, you know, I, I have no doubt you'll be on, on the front end of whatever it is. And uh, I know your fans will be there. And I look forward to being out there myself, Brad. I would love to, yeah, I'd love to have you out. We'll give you a beer and set you somewhere where you can enjoy it in, in the middle of, you know, actual human beings. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. Well, Me too. Stay out of stay out of the rain, and uh, I know it's coming. And thanks for doing this, and I uh, hope to hope to see you soon. Thank you for everything. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. you I too. hope next time I talk to you, they've figured this all out. <laughs> Let's hope so. We'll check back in there. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brad. Adios. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thanks. Nice.